One thing that would really help the Baltimore Orioles the trade deadline is if the Texas Rangers, with all their pitching available, were sellers. And the Orioles this weekend might have pushed them in that direction with a series win in Texas. I'll recap all three games coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Monday, July 22nd, 2024, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap the Orioles' series victory over the Texas Rangers this weekend as they went down to Arlington and took two of three and extended their lead atop the AL East. I'll tell you everything you need to know, what went right and what went wrong in all three games of the weekend. And that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on MLB and use code all lowercase locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. So the O's took the series. Unfortunately, could not quite come back losing three to two on Sunday to get the sweep, but some convincing wins earlier in the weekend, winning at nine to one on Friday, winning at eight to four on Saturday to clinch the series. Overall for the O's, they... End up playing some good baseball against Texas this year, going 5-2 and two against the Rangers and the Orioles. 60-39 and 39 on the season, still sitting there with the best record in the American League. The first AL team to 60 wins. And shout out to the Rays, who went in and took two of three from the Yankees at Yankee Stadium this weekend. And the Orioles are able to extend their lead now two games ahead of New York in the AL East. And we start today's episode with the Friday night win for the O's. Definitely the most convincing of the two wins this weekend and one of their more complete performances of the year. Winning at 9 to 1, excuse me, it felt like they scored 91 runs. Winning at 9 to 1 coming out of the All-Star break to beat the Rangers in the opener. And let's start with what went right on Friday night. Well, the offense went right. The long ball went right and it just looked like this Orioles team got its much-needed rest with the four days off. Even with five Orioles being in Arlington for the All-Star game, they just needed some time off. This offense was slumping, losing five of six going into the break. And it wasn't just losing five of six. It was because they weren't hitting at all. In that six-game stretch before the All-Star break, when they were swept by the Cubs and then miraculously won that Sunday game against the Yankees to avoid being swept by them too, they hit as a team 206. 251 on base, 322 slugging. They had a 63 WRC plus in that six game stretch. Remember that is kind of an all encompassing weighted offensive stat where league average is 100, meaning they were 37% worse than league average. The only team in baseball, the only offense in baseball that was worse in the final six games before the all-star break was the Chicago White Sox, who happened to be the worst team in the major league. So it was not good for the Orioles. In that stretch, they struck out only five, or excuse me, they struck out 25% of the time. They walked only 5% of the time. They hit only three home runs in that stretch as well, which is not what you are used to seeing from the Orioles. And they had just a 29% hard hit rate. This is a team that's been basically leading baseball in hard hit rate all year. But Friday against the Rangers, they just kind of turned things around. And it was about as immediate as it gets. Gunnar Henderson against Nathan Eovaldi, who, even though he wasn't great, I would still love for him to be an Oriole. Gunnar Henderson with a single off Nathan Eovaldi. Very next batter, Adley Rutschman. Two-run homer into the first row in right field and two batters in out of the All-Star break. It's 2 nothing O's. And then they kept going. Colton Kowser hits a two-run homer in that first inning. And all of a sudden, you leave the yard twice. You're up 4 nothing before Corbin Burns even gets to the mound. And it wasn't just big for the Orioles. It was big for some of their slumping hitters. Adley Rutschman did not have an extra base hit in the final seven games before the All-Star break. He was in a one for almost 30 slump. That was a big home run. Colton Kowser, it was his first homer since June 28th against the Rangers, also his hardest hit ball since then. I mean, he smacked that homer 420 feet. And for Colton Kowser, the other good thing was it came against a breaking ball from Nathan Eovaldi. 
only his third home run and ninth extra base hit against non-fastballs for Colton Kowser this year. We know the story of his season, amazing April, slumping in May, bad in June, picking it up a little bit in July, but still not great. And the issue has been he's hit all the fastballs, and anytime you throw him a curveball, a slider, a changeup, he just hasn't been able to hit it. So good to see him clobber a breaking ball on Friday night as well. And they hit 289 as a team, 41% hard hit rate. It was awesome to see. And they did a lot of this damage. Quite frankly, they did all of the damage on Friday night via the home run ball. It was the two homers there. And then Anthony Santander got to work. And he went up there and hit a two-run shot in the fifth to make it 6-1. to one, And then hit a three-run shot in the seventh to make it 9-1 to one and blow this game wide open. And so, yeah, did they score all nine runs off of home runs? Of course they did. But there has been a lot of talk about the Orioles relying too much on the home run ball. Now, I will continue to say, and the data backs it up, teams that hit more homers and rely on a bigger percentage of runs from home runs generally do better in the postseason because in the playoffs, the pitchers are better, the stakes are higher, it's a lot harder to string together multiple hits and walks. But if you get a postseason shot where you get a couple of guys on, the teams that can turn that into a three-run homer with one swing tend to do better. That's what we saw from the Rangers last year. Rangers, Astros, and Braves, last three champions, have home run scoring rates around 50%. That's right where the Orioles are as well. And so it's a good thing. But here's the thing. The upside is also so, so high when you can just leave the yard at any time. And the O's got some base runners on. Again, they hit four homers. None of them were solo shots. That's big. They had base runners on ahead of their home runs. This is a way to win baseball games in October. You think about this O's offense last year. While it was great, a lot of what the Orioles did last season is because of how good they were with runners in scoring position. Remember, the Orioles spent basically all of 2023 as like the best hitting team in baseball with runners in scoring position. And that's great. And it produces a lot of runs. But it's much more luck-based. It's much more sequencing-based on when you're getting your hits. And then we saw in the ALDS, they get, didn't get those hits in the big spots, and they were swept by Texas, who hit the home run ball in that series. Now you have a different Orioles offense, which is still good. It's, it's even a little bit better scoring-wise. And they're kind of middle of the pack with runners in scoring position, but they're the best home run hitting team. This is an offense that is going to be better set up for the postseason. That's what we're here for. Like, yes, we want them to win the AL East and get good seeding, but it seems like at this point, unless the Orioles really collapse, they're going to make the playoffs. It's about not having what happened last year happen again. This offense is set up well. Here's the other thing. Gunnar Henderson's been their best hitter. He's their MVP candidate. He had his first four-hit game of the season on Friday night in the third of his career, and he didn't even have any of the home runs. Gunnar just went up there four for five with three or four singles and three runs scored. He can do that as well to help out your offense. Now, what went wrong on Friday night? Kind of nothing. I mean, you win a game 9-1 to one against the defending World Series champs coming out of the All-Star break. You feel pretty good. I guess the only thing you can nitpick is Corbin Burns walking four batters. That was the first time he had walked four batters all year, a season high for Burns in an Oriole uniform. And it was because he just had a little bit of issues with cutter command. Only had a 45% in-zone rate on the cutter on Friday night. So a couple of times when he would throw a 3-2 pitch, when he would rely on the cutter to hit the corner, it would just miss, and the Rangers were pretty patient against him. But those walks didn't hurt him because Burns was so good at stranding runners. He had a filthy curveball on Friday night, which was really fun to watch. Got multiple big strikeouts with that pitch. Six whiffs on the curveball, 13 overall for Burns on the night. And... You got to think about what he's going through. Talked about it a little bit last week. You know, he'd love to be spending even more time back at home in Arizona with his wife and their newborn twins. And he spent as much time as he could there this week while still being an all-star and starting the all-star game on Tuesday night. But he comes right back to Arlington, makes the start. And uh, guess what? Just does Corbin Burns thing. Six innings, one run, two hits, six Ks. Yeah, the four walks, a lot of solo home run to Nathaniel Lowe in the second inning, 101 pitches. He's got a 2-3-8 ERA as an Oriole. He's just fantastic every time he goes out there, and he continued that on Friday night. And then the shout-out, too, on Friday. Well, shout-out to the Oriole bullpen. Now, they weren't in really any high-leverage spots because, as I mentioned, Santander hit the home run in the top of the seventh to make it 9-1. to one. So when they first went to the pen and, and Keegan Aiken came out there, the Orioles had an eight-run lead. That's not anything close to high leverage. But Keegan Aiken was awesome in his first second-half appearance only base runner he allowed, he, he hit a batter, but otherwise three strikeouts in two scoreless and hitless innings. O's turn it over to Birch Smith, 
who went one, two, three with a strikeout in the ninth to close it out in his second appearance as an Oriole. He's looked pretty good. Birch Smith also got a big out in Sunday's game out of the bullpen as well. And this was a bullpen that had had a five plus ERA in July and had been struggling, but also a 27% strikeout rate as a bullpen in July is kind of way up from where the Orioles are. They're right around 12th in Major League Baseball in bullpen strikeout rate. The Really, the addition this bullpen needs is a guy who can miss bats. Maybe they've got some more guys like Aiken and Smith who can miss more bats. I still think they should add a reliever, but they're kind of, you know, ERA going up, but also strikeout rate going up. You need to find a way to get the K rate up and the ERA to come down, and maybe the Orioles can find that healthy medium with that bullpen, but definitely a good outing, good appearance, good game all around on Friday night for the O's to take the opener in this series. And then they turned their attention to Saturday. We're looking to clinch a series victory in Arlington. And they did just that with another good start and another fantastic offensive performance. I'll break down Saturday's win over the Rangers coming up right after this. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Prize Picks. For me, the most fun and exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. What do you do at Prize Picks? Well, after you download the app, all you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. So you look at Team USA trying to rack up the gold, you can make a Prize Picks lineup of players across basketball, soccer, tennis, golf, and more. And it takes as little as 60 seconds. So download the Prize Picks app today and use code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code Locked On MLB on Prize Picks for a deposit match up to $100. That's at Prize Picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. And today's episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. It's the formula for winning championships, but it's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. And with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber and not cash. So with all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. So the O's had one of their most complete wins of the year to open up the uh, second half. It's not really the second half. You play almost 100 games before the All-Star break to open up the post-All-Star break part of the season with a win on Friday night 9-1 to over the Rangers. Then they turn it over to Saturday looking to see if the offense could stay hot after uh, being real cool heading into the break. And the offense did just that. It was an 8-4 to victory on Saturday for the O's over Texas that clinched the series. And we start with what went right. Well, what went right was that the offense scored again and also showed that it can score in some other ways. Now, I talked about Friday night, nine runs all coming home on the four home runs the Orioles hit from Rutschman, Kowser, and two from Santander. Now, they still hit home runs on Saturday, so don't get me wrong there. Cedric Mullins had a solo shot. Jordan Westberg had a two-run shot. O'Hearn had an impressive oppo taco, a solo shot in the eighth inning. So yeah, they still had three long balls. But the big inning for the Orioles in Saturday's game was the four-run second against Max Scherzer to go up 4 nothing for the second straight day. And they knocked Scherzer out of there in two innings, four runs, 53 pitches for the future Hall of Fame right-hander. And what they did in that fourth inning was score without hitting a home run. They go up there against Scherzer, who, let's be honest, is not the Max Scherzer of old. And I think everyone knows that at this point, especially with the multiple injuries he has suffered. But Westberg singles and Kowser walks. And then Mullins goes up there to lay down a sack bunt. And Scherzer throws the ball into right field. A run scores. They get second and third. Arias comes through with a two-run single. And then they get a big hit from Santander with two outs to keep it going. O'Hearn walks. Finally, Kirstan grounds out. 
And at the end of that inning, you know, the Orioles are sending all nine guys to the plate, scoring four runs against Scherzer and forcing the Ranger bullpen to enter in the third inning. And that ended up being up huge for the rest of that game, huge for the series. They can score in other ways. They got some hits with runners in scoring position and they got on base. And that has been the other big thing that people, despite the Orioles scoring the most runs per game in baseball for most of this season, the Orioles have got a lot of pushback on A, too many home runs, not sure why that's a problem, but relying too much on the home run, and the other has been not getting on base enough. Now, that's more of a valid criticism. The O's have had more of a closer to middle of the pack on base percentage this year, despite all the power, but what they did Saturday was pretty impressive. The Orioles drew a season-high nine walks in that game on Saturday. Now, they didn't bring them all home. They did, especially in those last couple of innings, they, they left some chances out there on the field to really break it wide open. And the Rangers did squeak back a little bit into this game because the Orioles couldn't quite break it open and got two in the eighth and got a couple on in the ninth just to make it a little bit interesting in this eight to four game. But the Orioles, I mean, you had O'Hearn walking twice. You had Kowser walking twice. You had a bunch of guys with one walk. You add to the fact that the Orioles were hit by a pitch three times and happy Ryan O'Hearn's okay. He took a pitch right off the kneecap, stayed in the game, and then homered in his next at bat. The Orioles had a total of 12 free passes. I mean, O'Hearn had a hilarious day where he goes one for two with a home run, a strikeout, two walks, and two hit by pitches in one game. That is a full day for Ryan O'Hearn. But 12 free passes, you're going to score runs. And again, if they had one or two more big hits, they could have had a 12, 13 run outing in this one against Max Scherzer, but really against the Texas bullpen, which is what they saw for most of this game. They walked, they got some clutch hits, they got a bunt down when they needed to, like, good, complete performance, back-to-back games from the offense. And hey, maybe they just need to play the Rangers every game. Five and two against Texas. They've had some of their best offensive performances against the Rangers this year, like getting out some of those demons from last October. Now, what went wrong in Saturday's win was Grayson Rodriguez early in the game because he was laboring early in this one, was able to squeeze out of the first inning without allowing a run. But then in the second, He allowed two. Two on with two outs. He gives up a two-run single to the nine-hitter, the backup catcher, Andrew Kisner. And he finally makes it through two innings. His pitch count was over 50 through just two innings of work. And even though he had a 4-2 lead because the Orioles had gotten all over Scherzer, you're like, man, like, can he get through four innings maybe? Like, it was looking tough. You're thinking the O's are going to have to dive deep into the bullpen to get through this game. He his command was a little off with everything. He really did not have his changeup, his best secondary pitch early in the game. And it looked like the wheels were going to kind of fall off of Rodriguez. But then he came back out in the third and he just kind of locked back in and he threw four consecutive scoreless out innings. He relied on the fastball. It was incredible in this game. And he somehow got through six, six innings for Rodriguez in this one, two runs on three hits. He struck out eight and walked two through a hundred and three pitches, just five hard hit balls against him by the Rangers. And what he did with basically just his fastball, I mean, he had a couple of good curveballs and a couple of good sliders, and he found the change up a little bit, kind of sprinkled in through those final four innings, but not nearly what it's been in some of his best starts this year. He was super fastball heavy because he kind of had to, because he didn't have great command of his other pitches. And, you know, 40 out of, out of 148 out of 103, his pitches for the fastball, 13 whiffs on 25 swings against that four-seam fastball was pretty absurd from Grayson Rodriguez. You add in the fact that he got 10 foul balls on those swings that, yeah, it was just two balls in play off the fastball. Now, one of them was hit 106 off the bat, but the Rangers just could not make contact with his four-seamer. I mean, 13 whiffs on 25 swings is ridiculous. 52% whiff rate on his fastball, the best ever, 13 whiffs the most ever in one start. When you get that extension that Grayson does, he gets some of the best extension down the mound in baseball, and we know he's got elite velocity, running up to 98 on Saturday night. You can get through, albeit a struggling major league lineup in the Rangers, but a major league lineup with just that fastball and then just showing enough of your secondaries, right? Enough good changeups, enough good curveballs, enough good sliders. He didn't have any of them fully, but had enough of them late in the game where he could power through six innings, and he came back out in the sixth, and that was his best inning. You know, he was pushing 90 pitches, and he strikes out the side in the sixth, and it was at a point where it looked pretty clear that 
Grayson, if he allowed just one more base runner in that sixth inning, Hyde was going to pull him, and he just gets three Ks and is pumped up leaving the mound. That was a really fun start to watch after kind of a disastrous start. And you really think about it, like the at-bat from Andrew Kisner, the two-run single in the second, the only runs that the Rangers got off of Grayson, he got ahead of Kisner 0-2, who's a backup catcher and not a good hitter. And then he threw back-to-back fastballs, which were both balls, and they were both called balls, 2-2. Two and two. But if you look at the insane strike zone from home plate umpire Scott Barry on Saturday night, I mean, his strike zone was horrendous. It was all over the place. You never knew where it was. Those next two pitches at different times later in the night were called strikes. So there was a good chance Grayson could have gotten one of those calls. And he might have labored through six scoreless, if not for those two. Then he kind of threw a pitch down the middle and Kisner hit it the other way for a two-run single. But he almost went six scoreless with basically no changeup and bad command of some of his pitches. Like, He's going to be special. It it all clicks sometimes. It's not consistent yet. He still has his issues, as we saw early. But man, oh man, when he gets going, even with just that fastball, it's fun to watch him go. And then the shout-out for Saturday's game. Shout-out to Ramon Arias. I mean, I'll admit it. I'm starting to think more and more that, you know, his days might be numbered in Baltimore. He is certainly not in any kind of everyday role anymore for the Orioles. And he hasn't exactly been great with the bat this year and even on Sunday he was scratched from the lineup due to neck soreness the Orioles were planning on giving Gunnar Henderson a day off against the lefty and Ramon Arias was in there and then he has some neck soreness he's scratched they got to put Gunnar back into the lineup so we'll, we'll kind of keep our eye on Arias's health but you know just with his struggles and the defense hasn't been as good he's not playing a lot and you're looking down at AAA and now you got Kobe Mayo healthy and now Jackson Holiday is finally healthy enough to play the field. Holiday came back from that elbow injury but was DHing for a couple of weeks. Now Holiday first played second base again on Friday and and Holiday hit two home runs on Friday and Mayo's still mashing and but here's the thing like Arias is still contributing and here's the other thing like Mayo is still making some rough plays at third base. He had a rough play at first base on Sunday in Norfolk like he just that throwing arm it almost looks like he has the yips at times when he tries to throw and Arias is bad as kind of heating up again. He gets in the lineup, not like he's playing every day, but he gets in the lineup on Saturday and he provides his first three hit game of the season. Arias goes three for four with a walk, three singles, a run scored, a couple of RBIs. Like he was huge out of the nine hole for the Orioles. Had the big two run single in the second inning to, to really put that big inning on Max Scherzer. And in July, Ramon Arias in 28 plate appearances, hitting 429. 571 on base, 571 slug, a double, a triple, four RBIs, and seven walks to only two strikeouts. That is a 231 WRC+. plus. He's been a top 10 hitter in baseball, minimum 25 plate appearances, in the month of July. And only seven of the 19 balls he's put in play have been hard hit. He's not mashing the baseball, but it's still a better hard hit rate than we've seen all year. And I still do think Ramon Arias does not survive this entire season on the Orioles roster. But when he really starts to hear the footsteps, that's when he starts swinging it better. So shout out to him for giving the O's some production out of the nine hole and helping the Orioles to an eight to four win on Saturday to clinch the series. So next up, it was going for the sweep. It was Dean Kramer versus Andrew Haney on Sunday. And the Orioles came close to a comeback win, but couldn't get it done. Tell you why they lost on Sunday to finish off the episode coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by FanDuel. Listen, I love sports. I love them so much I never want them to stop. But we're in this kind of summer season where things wind down a little bit. Like, yes, you got Major League Baseball and the Olympics are coming up later this week. But in general, it feels like there's less going on unless you're going to FanDuel. Because this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right, there's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer at FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. And today's episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by the DK Law Group. The DK Law Group is a Maryland-based law firm who is redefining the legal process with their modern approach. The DK Law Group specializes in real estate law, estate planning, business law, and family law. They're tech savvy, they treat their clients like family, and they focus on keeping your legal solutions simple. And the DK Law Group, they know that speed is key. By leveraging technology, DK Law Group streamlines the process to serve you better 
and faster. So contact the DK Law Group today at DKLawMD.com. And Locked On Orioles listeners can call today to schedule a free 30-minute consultation when you mention the tagline, Empowering Legacies. So the Orioles had a chance to pull off the sweep in Texas on Sunday afternoon, but could not do it, falling 3-2 to two in the series finale. Still took two out of three, still a big series win on the road, but they couldn't get it done on Sunday. Now, what went right on Sunday? I would say the pitching mostly went right for the Orioles. Like when you give up three runs, you probably feel good about your pitching staff, only six hits. You're feeling solid about that. You feel like you have a good chance to win. And Dean Kramer got the start, his fourth start off the injured list with the tricep issue. He's had one good start, two bad starts. And he looked really good. He was cruising. Pitch count was low. He was throwing strikes through those first three innings. Then in the fourth, you do what you just can't do, especially in a 0-0 game. And that is walk two batters. Now, he got a strikeout to start the fourth, then a walk, then a flyout, then another walk. He walked low and Langford. And on both of those walks, he had them in 3-2 counts. And both of his 3-2 pitches, the one to Langford, a fastball, the one to low was a splitter. Both were not even close to the strike zone, like pitches where either batter didn't really have to consider swinging on 3-2. So he puts himself in a spot, two on, two out, and 0-0 game in the fourth, and he hangs a first pitch splitter to Jonah Heim, and Heim crushes a three-run homer into right center field, opens the scoring, and that was all Kramer gave up, but that was all the Rangers needed in this game. And he came back out there, and he got a scoreless fifth, but then he got into trouble in the sixth and, and came out of the game with runners on the corners and one out. It's just like... Yeah, this was better for Dean Kramer overall than his last two starts were a little rough. He ends up going five and a third, three runs, five hits, two Ks, three walks, and a home run on 89 pitches. And he got hit hard like we'll generally see. But he just not missing a lot of bats and only a 44% overall zone rate. Didn't really trust the splitter in general. I thought the stuff looked pretty good, but was just kind of spraying it around. Like didn't have very great command. And it's just another start that makes you question, okay, what are you going to be asking from Dean Kramer down the stretch? You know, at this point, he's the Euros' number three starter. I don't think you want him starting a playoff game. It's another reason why you want to go get at least one starting pitcher at the deadline. He's He's a good number five starter. And I don't know if he's more than that at this point, but just you can't walk those guys. It's going to hurt you. And it hurt him in a big way with that Heim homer. Now the bullpen came in and did a great job. I mean, shout out to Brian Baker. Who came in there? It was first and third and, and one out, got a huge double play to get the Orioles out of the sixth and help Kramer's line from getting any worse. And then Baker went right back out there and got a one, two, three, seventh. He was looking good. Keegan Aiken, a couple of outs in the eighth. Birch Smith, one pitch, one out to end the eighth inning. So, you know, Baker, Aiken, and Smith did a great job of keeping it right where it was, keeping it a three nothing and then at a three two game. So, you know, Dean Kramer not his best, but overall a, a good pitching afternoon. Now, what went wrong for the Orioles was kind of the offense mostly kind of like the pitching mostly for what went right. They scored 17 combined runs in the first two games, and they only put together two on Sunday. Really did not have anything going. Like in this game, Gunnar Henderson drew a leadoff walk against Andrew Haney. And then the next three batters, Rutschman, Santander, and Mountcastle, all crushed baseballs into center field. All like were close to homers. The ballpark, unfortunately, held all three of them. Leota Tavares ran all three down, and it was a scoreless first for Haney. And then that was kind of the only pressure that the Orioles put on him for the rest of the game. He ended up throwing five scoreless and they go to the bullpen and the O's can't do anything against Sabors in the sixth and seventh. And then the O's just showed a little bit of life. Rutschman gets on via walk. Santander crushes another home run, a two run shot in the eighth, his 27th of the year. And all of a sudden it's a three, two game in the eighth inning and Westberg gets on and you, you get O'Hearn up there as a pinch hitter with one swing could give the Orioles the lead. Unfortunately, was not able to do it, but they showed a little life late, which was great. They drew four more walks, which was nice. Didn't hit the ball as hard as they had all weekend, but just kind of a eh, game. Haney shut them down for the second straight start. Like not what you want from the offense, but I think still in general, you're feeling good about this offensive performance all weekend after how bad they were before the all-star break. And the shout out to the shout out in Sunday's game, the shout out goes to the Rangers pitching staff and maybe not the way you're thinking, the Rangers, after losing this series, now 47 and 52, going to be somewhere between six and seven games back in the division and eight and nine games back in the wild card, heading into play on Monday. That is with eight days here before the trade deadline. Now, to me, a team that far out, that close to the deadline, should be thinking about selling somewhat. Now, for the Rangers, you would think they would 
probably not trade away a lot of their big pieces because they just won the World Series last year. And it's tough to tell to a fan base, hey, we just won the World Series and now we're selling. And they're a team with enough talent that's going to try to be very good again and try and win it all again in 2025. But it, I just feel like, and maybe this is me being a little selfish, wanting some of these players on the Orioles, I feel like they should at least try to sell off some of the great rental pitching that they have available. Just look at what the Rangers did the O Sunday. Now, Josh Sabors was great over two innings. He's got a lot of team control. He's not being traded. But Andrew Haney, five scoreless after having another great seven-inning start his last time against the O's. He's a rental. David Robertson did give up that home run to Santander, but otherwise he's been amazing this year. He is a rental. Kirby Yates, one, two, three, ninth with two strikeouts to get the save. He's been amazing. He's got a 1-0-2 ERA this year. Is also a rental. I would love if the Orioles deadline was Haney, Robertson, and Yates. Like, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think you're getting three pitchers from one team, but those three would all be incredible additions to the Orioles if they decided to sell their rentals. And they looked good on Sunday. We saw it up close and personal. I'm hoping the Rangers at least consider trading away these rentals. And maybe the O's can go there because there was a lot of pitching talent on this Texas roster. That's not even to add to Nathan Eovaldi, who, yes, the Orioles kind of got to him Friday night, but he's been great this year. He would be great on the Orioles. Just Texas, Chris Young, Rangers DM, if you're thinking about it, just uh, consider it. Consider trading with the Orioles. If you want to know more about these Rangers and how they're going to play the deadline, check out Locked on Rangers. Our boy Bryce Patterick does a great job over at that show. They're going to have this whole deadline covered. You know, you want to check that one out as well. But that'll do it for today's episode of Locked on Orioles. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back tomorrow, even though the Orioles, thankfully, have another off day before they head to Miami to start a series on Tuesday. But I will continue previewing the trade deadline. We are only eight days away. The O's are going to look for some pitching. I'll take a look at the controllable relievers out there. My wish list of the top six controllable relievers, guys who are under contract after this year, who could help the Orioles bullpen at this deadline. That's coming up on tomorrow's episode. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day.